the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. And then from Joshua 24, 14 to 15. Now, the fear of, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of the word. Um, you may be seated. Thank you, Sister Laura. Good morning, church. I caught the flu this week, and so I'm still wobbly, and so I'm going to sit down for this sermon. And Ronnie's promised that if I fall over, he's going to pick up my notes and keep going. So regardless, you're going to get a full, full sermon in. How are you doing today? Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, <clears throat> magic. Magic. You probably, when you think of magic, you don't necessarily think of Canadian culture. Um, I'm aware that for several of you, if you go back to uh, what you consider your, your home country, if you go back in time a little bit, uh, the practice of magic is there. It might be out in the, in the village somewhere. Um, my first encounter with, with magic in, in Canada was when I was 16, about 16 years old, and I took a family vacation out to see our relatives in Nova Scotia, out on the East Coast. And it was, a, it was an awesome trip. Nova Scotia was this, this beautiful place. Uh, I remember it being really funny that, you know, these people were my, my cousins, and yet I could barely understand. We could barely understand each other because of the, just the different language. We were both speaking English and not, yet not speaking English, if that, if that makes sense. And, uh, and I, I remember that, you know, after I think it was a couple, couple of weeks of, of being there, uh, it just came up in a family discussion that, 
uh, our relatives out there, if you went back like a generation, they took tea reading very seriously. And, and tea reading was the idea of, of you, you have a cup of tea, and then with the tea leaves that are remaining at the bottom of the cup, you can discern uh, answers to, to questions, or you can discern pieces to the future. And, uh, and so I remember hearing this, and it was so alien to me. I thought, are we, are we really related? <laughs> and uh, and I, that was my, my first thought. And I, the, the second thought was, in, in my mind, because you know, at, that, at that time I was, I, I think I, I had a, a love for the hard sciences, for biology and chemistry. And so uh, the idea of, of someone believing in magic seemed so foreign and stupid to me. And so I remember thinking of that, and, I, I, and I, my reaction was, how could anyone take this seriously? Um, and, and another piece to it was that, as far as I knew, uh, all my relatives out there attended church. They, they were believers and had been for generations. And I thought, so how do you, how do you participate in magic while well, also being a Christian? Because I remember all those sermons from the, the 90s where uh, about every Halloween, the pastor focused in on the Ouija board. I don't know if you remember those. But where the, the driving message was that magic, Ouija boards, um, white magic, and being a follower of Jesus were completely incompatible. And so uh, that, was, that was my opening experience um, to, to magic uh, as, a, as a young guy. And you probably have you probably have similar stories, either of your own experiences, and, um, and some, some of these experiences that you have, um, you know, could be experiences where you very much experience something real that happens, something in the spiritual realm that, that happens when magic was used. But the focus for today is that when we get into this part of the book of Acts, as we head to Ephesus, magic becomes something that goes from being on the side or something that is, is kind of peripheral in the culture to the very core of the culture. And the assumption is that everything can be manipulated and controlled through magic. There's no question of does magic work or does magic not work? Is it real or not real? In Ephesus, magic is real, magic works, and you need to use magic in order to get what you need in life. And so magic was practiced by just about everyone in just about every area of life in the Greek and Roman world. And so everything from cures for illnesses. You know, if, if I was living back then and I felt like I was this week, I, I would, and I was a Greek guy, I would go and I would get some magic to start feeling better this week. Uh, anything from health to Get your, get your business up and running and get it back in the black. Use magic to help your business. If you had rats in your house, well, get a magic amulet, amulet and those rats will disappear. If your favorite guy in the chariot race uh, was up and running that week, you wanted to make sure you cast a magic spell so he would win in the chariot race. And so it was believed that just absolutely everything could be manipulated by magic. And so the, the assumption that magic worked uh, was just culturally accepted every, everywhere in that world. But there were two pieces, two core pieces that you needed to have your magic work according to the, the Greek and Roman thought. And the first is you needed a magical object. And so it could be an amulet, it could be a, a voodoo doll uh, type of thing, um, it, it could be a, a tablet, and part one was you needed a physical object for the magic to work through. But that object in and of itself wasn't enough. It was kind of like if you had a computer without any of the software running. It was, it was just an object. The second part that was necessary to have your magic work was that you, you needed to have the right words to say in the right order to energize the object. And so you had to know what the magical incantations were, the exact right words in the exact right way. And these were passed on, and, and there were different levels of it. 
Anything from your great-grandmother in your clan would, would have you over and she would say, I want you to, to know these magic words, these magic incantations, so that you can carry them through for your family. Say these each time your kids are sick or use this each time uh, that you want to have a baby, you know, and, and things like that. And so they were passed on, on that way where it's just kind of generation to generation stayed in the family. Um, the, the, other, the other end of the spectrum was that if you needed big specific magic, you had to go to a professional and you had to pay them to reveal to you the right incantations matched up with the right object to get what you wanted through magic. And so there were uh, scrolls that you had to buy or books that you needed. There were instruction manuals. And there were magical experts who certified that each one would work. And so into this, this world, you have a booming magic market. Both the objects and the incantations or the scrolls, so the objects and the right words to say, are worth a lot of money because this is power. And so this was a thriving, huge, expensive part of life. And so here we are, we're going to go to Ephesus uh, this week. And so Paul and his team, they've left Macedonia and they've come back over to what was considered Asia, uh, the continent of Asia. And Ephesus is a boomtown for magic. And uh, archaeologists and scholars, when they go through digs, they're still finding up to today uh, old papyrus that show these different magical incantations from the city of Ephesus. So much, so much was used in Ephesus that a lot of it has survived, even, even a couple thousand years later to today. That's how prevalent that it, it was. And so... The context of where we are now with the, the reading the Lord just did for us was that the Lord Jesus is at work through Paul in Ephesus. And by, by the action of the Spirit of God, um, people are being healed. Diseases are being cured. Demons are being cast out. And previous to Paul showing up, any of those actions would have been done with expensive magic in Ephesus. And so through the ministry of Paul and his team, through their mission, these amazing healings and, uh, and rescues from demonic oppression and possession are happening. But God is doing this because he is affirming the message that Paul is sharing that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus has come and he saves, that through him we have forgiveness of sins. And so God is affirming the gospel message with these moves of power by his spirit. And so Paul is sharing that these things are from God. And these are moments where we say heaven and earth meet, and humans experience restoration, and they experience freedom that's brought to them by their creator. And what I want you to notice, if you look back, it's not expensive amulets or items that God is using to bring healing through Paul. What are the two items that are mentioned there? What, what, what is God using? Can you, can you look back on that? What are the two things? Handkerchiefs and aprons. Thank you. Thank you. So rather than big, expensive, magical items, God is working through snot rags and work aprons. And so what I think is happening here is God is making fun of the magic industry and culture. He's totally undermining it. He's saying... You don't need anything, anything fancy or, or special here. I'm the living God. I can work through even aprons and snot rags. And the other thing that is showing us is that Paul is working among the poor. And so healing and, demonic, and, and freedom from demonic possession is, is now no longer 
something that can only happen for those who are wealthy enough to afford the magic. God is bringing his salvation to the poor and his mercy and his peace to the poor. Everyone's got an apron. Everyone's got a snot rag. And so this is how God is at work. Okay. We know from how we see how, how we see the story from the inside out because we are followers of Jesus and we understand what God is, is doing, that this is the Holy Spirit at work. This is God's personal presence at work. But from the outside looking in, as far as um, those who do not, do not know the gospel message, what it looks like is a new powerful magic is on the scene in Ephesus. That you can invoke the name of Jesus in order for powerful magic to take place. Essentially, you can have any object in their mind, okay? But if you say the right incantation now with the name of Jesus, you're going to accomplish the magic that you're hoping to do. And so this has become really attractive. So this is, this is the background to the seven sons of Sceva, Siva. And so these guys, they're Jews who are in Ephesus. And uh, I'll put it this way. These are guys that have no scruples about being hired to cast out demons, okay? They're willing to do this for, for pay, and that's what's going on in this situation. And so the seven sons of Siva, uh, they're going around, they've been going around and they've been casting out demons, um, and they, they see that Paul is ministering and that demons are being cast out and people are being healed. And so what they do is they make the mistake of believing that the name of Jesus is just like any other incantation. It's just the right words that carry out the work that they want to do. And so their work is totally devoid of the gospel message. Their work is totally devoid of the Spirit's movement. And the way they treat the name of Jesus is just like this. Just like one of the magical incantations. And so they hold a very low view of the name of Jesus. There's no lordship there. The name of Jesus is something that serves them in their business of basically magic. And so we shouldn't be surprised that when they go to invoke the name of Jesus as if it were a magic scroll, did they get beaten so badly? Because when the Holy Spirit isn't a part of their work, the face-off with the demon is no longer God versus the demon, which happens when there's a power encounter where Christians are involved because we have God's Holy Spirit living on us, the personal presence of God. And so when we confront uh, a heavenly being that's in rebellion to God, it's God versus that evil heavenly being. And so God's authority comes in and casts out that demon. Now for this, the seven sons of Sceva, what it is, is it's just a human. It's just seven humans versus a heavenly being who's been in rebellion to God for a very long time. And so between the heavenly being and these guys, who do you think is more powerful? Yeah, the demon is. And so one guy beats the snot out of these, this, this group of seven. And I wish there was a video recording of it. That would be... Like, just the ultimate UFC matchup. And it would be a good lesson to pass on to everyone else, you know? If you're thinking of doing the same, watch this video first. It's like a training video or something like that. And so, and so, yeah, so this happens, and it is a trigger for cultural change in Ephesus. Because Paul has been preaching the whole time, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Messiah. And people hadn't revered him as Lord over their life. In Ephesus, they had revered his, only his name as far as what it could do for them in terms of magic. But now what they, what they see here is that, no, what Paul has been saying is true. The name of Jesus is now held in high honor. And so you honor a king, you honor a lord. 
you don't use that name simply to get what you want. And so the people of Ephesus start to get it. Jesus is the authoritative king that Paul has been telling you about. And they witness the reality of what Paul has been preaching. Magic has no part in the lives of those who follow Jesus. So what happens is now, family by family, clan by clan, clan by clan, household by household, they gather up their magic scrolls and their magical items. They make a big bonfire and everything is destroyed. And so the value is 50,000 drachmas. Another, wor- another way to, to say this, 50,000 days of work. Anyone want to do the math of that? 50,000 working days are destroyed in value. So 50,000, that is years and years and years worth of magical items that are gone. And so a major chunk of the, the magic culture and industry in Ephesus is destroyed in a day. And it's, it, it's a grassroots movement. The people are choosing to do this themselves. And so magic, the magic industry, and this part of the Ephesian culture that had been like the, the tie, that, the tie that, that bounds people together, magic moves from being at the center of Ephesian life and is replaced by a Christ-centeredness that's there. And so what's, what's so interesting about that is that <clears throat> is that there's no turning back there's no turning back when you you burn all of this and so i have a discussion question for you this morning and this question, discussion question is this why didn't they why didn't those who burned all these items you know 50,000 working days worth so think of it as like a billion dollars a billion dollars why didn't they sell the magic items for a profit and use the money to help the poor instead? Go ahead and discuss that with your neighbor. See what kind of answer you come up with. Okay, what did you come up with? No more market. That's a very business answer. Well done, James. Just go over to Thessalonica. There's still a market there. Hurry. Yeah. That's a good answer. No more market. That's a practical one. Yeah. How many of you would be, I'm going to sell this off, you know? Yeah. 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 That's you got it, brother Tom. And so, what what the followers, the the new followers of Jesus in Ephesus recognize, and they're they're likely obeying teaching that's come uh, from from Paul and and other other Christians there, is that magic is not meant to be a part of any human's life. And so as Christians, we don't live in a little bubble where we go, okay, we know what is right and true. We'll just keep that in our bubble. If you're on the outside and we happen to profit from evil, but you're outside our community, then we're okay with it. That's not to be us at all. The followers of Jesus do not profit off of what God calls evil. Ever. Ever. 
And so it's this Christian ethic that Tom, Brother Tom's sharing here it, that places a higher value on, on the well-being of humans being in right relationship with God than on personal financial gain. And that's an ethic we need to continue to live with today where we don't isolate our faith into a certain silo, a certain community. We live out our faith in every area of our life, including our finances. And so there will be times in your, your life where you have great opportunity to make great profit and investment out of something that God would call evil. And so hold your ground. Follow this ethic. Value people the way God values people. All right, that's answer number one. The second answer is that I believe that Paul's additional teaching and preaching has reintroduced the idea that the Ephesians, they have a Heavenly Father who knows what they need, is near to them, cares for their needs, and has the ability to provide for everything for the future. And so they're not going to act out of worry. They're not going to be motivated to sell off what they know to be evil in order to have funds for the future when they recognize they have a Heavenly Father who is going to provide for their needs as they follow the ways of His Son, step by step, going forward. And that's the same for us today. So, this changes everything in Ephesus. There's no more calling up demons to curse the the, the chariot that you don't want to have win, okay? Uh, there's no more creation of love potions to get the girl who doesn't really like you. There is no more rescuing your business with a pur- purchase of secret in- invocations. All of that is ending. And so if that was at the core of the society, it's going to be deeply felt. And there's going to be winners and losers financially as their world and culture changes and as God brings renewal for the Ephesians. And so I like the way that uh, Kevin Rowe says this. He says, the termination of magical practice and the burning of the books that make such practice possible visibly, thus visibly mark and publicly proclaim the end of a way of life. So if you burn your scrolls, it's going to it's going to be very hard to ever get those back. It's saying, uh, the, there's, there's no going back. I follow Jesus, no going back, no going back. And so, on that day, hundreds of households in Ephesus chose who they will serve, the Lord Jesus. And now we come to part two of the experience in Ephesus. Ephesus. And it's a different but completely related story to what's just happened. And we have the the huge riot that happens. And so turn with me uh, to Acts 19, and let's jump back into the text. So with this backdrop of the severe change that's happening, now we'll better understand this riot that happens. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about about the way, and so that means the followers of Jesus, Christians. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, You know, my friends that we receive a good income from this business. So here they are, and they're making the the shrines uh, for uh, the the worship of Artemis. And and the worship of Artemis was one of the biggest, um, as as far as the the greatest following in Ephesus was those who worshipped the goddess Artemis. You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says the gods made by human hands are no gods at all. And Paul's just talked about that in Athens. (sighs) 
There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be dis discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. So this is the, the temple of Artemis. If we can go to the next slide there. So there's the, you can still visit the ruins of it today. And on the right, that's, that's what it's believed to have looked at, like in its heyday. This place was huge, huge. When we think of a Greek or Roman temple, we just think, oh, people, people just went there and offered sacrifices and that, that was kind of, yeah, and the worship happened there and they went home. Much bigger than that. So Artemis was the biggest and most significant deity in Ephesus, and the temple to her was this place of not only offering sacrifices, but if you wanted to do banking, you went and you did banking with other guys who worshipped Artemis. And so your banking happened at the temple. The temple of Artemis also was the home of a library. And um, it was a place where if you were in trouble with the law, you could go and you could have sanctuary there. You could run away from your problems and go and be in the temple of Ar Artemis and, be, and have some safety there. Um, it was a place where uh, you went to have disputes settled, so it acted like the law courts of the land as well. And so when you see that temple, don't think of, um, don't think of something that's, that's small, but think of something that's big and has lots, lots of things in the same, under the same roof. So when you see the Temple of Artemis, think of Guilford Mall, okay? You can do your banking there. You can get some food there if you want. You can stop in at the, the Nike shop, right? And then you can, <coughs> you can go across and you can, you can watch a movie if you want to. And so, so much took place under the same roof. That's what this place was. It was the hub of culture. It was the hub of government. It was the, the, it was the hub of, um, of the city of, of Ephesus and its influence on the other areas, towns, and territories around them. It was a destination. Everyone came in to be at the temple of Artemis. So, what's happening here, and, and why the silversmith is worried, is that because of the missional work of the early church, the idle business and the industry in Ephesus is at risk of collapsing. But it's, it's even bigger than that. Demetrius, he's right. Demetrius is right. And if, if the number of people abandoning uh, the worship of Artemis to follow Jesus, if it reaches a tipping point, society as they currently know it is going to change forever. Because Artemis won't be at the center of everything anymore. And... And so the perceived danger is not only that they can lose business, but Ephesus will no longer be this destination city for the temple of Artemis. And as a city, he's going to say that they can lose their, their place of influence and prominence as one of the major hubs. So let's continue reading here. Verse 28. <coughs> Excuse me. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions and from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into a theater together. See, I told you there was a movie theater there. <laughs> Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. And so <clears throat> the, the crowd that has been stirred up, they start to shout the name of Artemis. And it's one of those pieces where we have to travel back into that world to understand what's going on. So <clears throat> the Greek gods, they weren't always available. We, we know that our Father in Heaven, He hears every word that we utter. We know that He's near. We know that uh, when we pray, He hears us 
And that's, that's a good assumption. That's a true assumption. It's what is our norm. And so when we, when we read back into uh, this time, we, we assume the same thing. The Greeks didn't believe that their gods and goddesses heard them right away. Because their gods and goddesses might be busy doing something on Mount Olympus. Their deities are, are off somewhere else. And there was the potential that their deity could be drunk in a stupor. They may be too, totally indifferent to their followers in that moment. You know, they were pretty temperamental deities. And so what you had to do is you had to basically annoy your deity enough by yelling at them to get them to respond and to act, to even wake them up if your deity was slumbering. And so this yelling for great as Artemis of the Ephesians is an act of worship to wake up their gods. And so does that remind you of any stories from the Old Testament too? With some of the, the prophets, with the, the actions of idol worshipers, where they, they dance around, they scream and shout, they cut themselves, all to get the attention of their deity. This has continued on, and this is in the Greek pantheon as well. And so Paul's being very brave here. I, I, man, I couldn't do what he did. Paul's going, he's, he's saying, let me at him. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to explain things. Because Paul's had the experience where time and time again, he's been in these tight situations where he's been in danger to authentically give a response and an answer. And God has always given him the right words to say in the moment every time. And so even with thousands of guys shouting at him, thousands of, of, uh, of, of these worshipers of Artemis and these, these, these people who their livelihoods are attached to her continued worship and, and Paul and the gospel undermining it, he's saying, let me in there. And so his friends are holding him back. The city officials are holding him back. But he wants to get in there. Verse 34. Sorry, verse 32. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. Poor Alexander, that's a rough situation. He motioned for for. Silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So this poor guy, Alexander, (coughs) he's pushed out in front as a representative of the Jewish community who are not followers of Jesus. And so the Greeks and Romans... They viewed Paul and, and the people of the way, the followers of Jesus, they viewed them as a sect of Judaism. They just viewed them as Jews. And so there was, there's, no, there's no distinction between Jew, Jews and Christians in that town. And so the, the local community who are not Christ's followers, they get, uh, they get this poor Alexander guy and they shove him out and they're trying to tell him, like, tell them that we have nothing to do with this Paul guy. All right? Let them know that it's not us that's causing this to happen. And he just gets shouted down because he's viewed as part of the problem. And so for two hours, there's this invocation to wake up Artemis. And she's not showing up to do anything. Artemis is not going to win the day. Let's see who's going to win the day. 35. Now we're introduced to the most powerful man in the city, the city clerk. Sorry, could you read for me? My voice is starting to go. Okay. So the clerk gets up. And he says to these guys, well, you're accusing Paul of saying that the, the gods created with human hands are no gods at all. But he says, remember, the image of Artemis, we didn't create it. It came down from heaven. 
And so you can't be mad at Paul about this. He's trying to diffuse the situation. He's a smart guy. He's, he's, trying, he's trying to <coughs> take what's a, a horrendous potential for violence that could get the city in big trouble. And, and he is, in a calculated but true way, as far as the silversmiths can't, can't argue with him. If the silversmiths say that, oh, but no, we actually, we created that image of Artemis. They're not going to say that. And so he begins to diffuse the situation. And let's go ahead and read 36 all the way to the end. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. We're kind of... <laughs> <coughs> We're scattered a bit. <coughs> Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are pro councils. <coughs> they can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. <coughs> in that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion. Since then, no reason, since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. <clears throat> the city of Vancouver has had a couple of riots in my lifetime. Do you remember what, at least two, do you remember what each one has always been about? Ron, this question's going to you. You know the answer. Yeah, we, we riot over our sports team losing. When the Canucks lose in the, in the playoffs, in the Stanley Cup playoffs, Vancouver seems to riot. And how are, how are riots handled when, when that happens? Well, we basically let everything burn to the ground, clean it up over the next few weeks, and, and then we might start looking at um, who's in trouble. Not so back in this time. When cities would riot, government officials would have no qualms of moving their soldiers in and slaughtering the whole crowd of rioters. It was not put up with. And so there are multiple stories in the local context at this time of riots coming up. Some, sometimes it was slave riots in other areas. And <clears throat> usually the Roman proconsul or even city's officials would simply gather up the soldiers, send them in, and eliminate all the rioters. The second thing that could happen is that <clears throat> if your city rioted, your city could lose privileges like your city wouldn't be allowed to host the Olympic Games for a decade or two after a big riot. And so there were these big punishments that could happen. And so this is why uh, he gives this warning here. And so the city clerk's conclusion is this. <clears throat> it's not the followers of Jesus who are destabilizing things. It's you guys and how you're going about uh, your accusation today. And, and his words work, and everyone disperses. And so <clears throat> I want to come into what, what are the, the three main big ideas that we're, we're being presented with here today. The first is that I want to say that God has determined that he will bring cultural renewal to the world, even among some of the darkest places. And, and his will for that continues through to today. God will bring cultural renewal. And so as people begin to hear the gospel in different places or rehear the gospel, if there's been cultural decay, uh, stepping away from the lordship of Jesus and awareness of him, God brings renewal. And it's God's will that that will happen. And so when, when people become followers of Jesus, entire neighborhoods, cities, 
and uh, territories become impacted. Culture changes. And it changes in a specific direction. Because the renewal that God brings through Jesus and the presence of the Spirit is in a specific direction. And it's back towards the Eden experience and the Eden existence. And so when there's this cultural renewal brought on by following Jesus, these things like like magic are, are left behind because no longer is God distant and no longer are we fearful of life and so we have, to, we have to use magic as a crutch to get through life. But we have close fellowship with God. We can depend on him. There is provision that comes from God, just like in the garden. We can trust him for what we need. There is a high value of the human-to-human relationship that happens. And there is the recognition, recognition of the lordship of God over our lives. He determines how we will live and treat one another. But then there is also humans uh, (coughs) begin to live out the lordship that they're intended for to reign and rule on the earth. And so no longer in in the Christian communities, no longer is there demonic possession that that becomes, uh, no longer is that a norm in life because humans are back ruling over the earth under the authority of the creator. And so it's a radical shift and a radical change that happens into the likeness of Eden living. And the third is, while cultural norms and practices are torn down, so culture changes as people begin to to follow Jesus, people are rescued and built up. Cultural change with Christianity never happens because we destroy those who oppose us. And that's been lived out in such a wrong way at different pieces of, of our past. And there were different times when it was thought that, well, if these people (coughs) won't accept Christianity, we'll go to war with them, we'll destroy them, and we'll create a Christian nation here. And that is not how God establishes cultural renewal on the earth. It's not. Time and time again, uh, throughout the book of Acts, what we get to see is that cultural change comes not by might makes right, but comes through the church on mission and the gospel entering new places and the spirit coming into the lives of people. <clears throat> so I've got three questions that I want to close with this morning to ask you. Three questions to help us to respond to the Lord this morning. The first question is this. Is there anything in your life that God calls evil that you give yourself a cultural pass on? In your workplace? in private, so when no one's watching, or in your family clan. And so just think back, think back to uh, my East Coast family and the, the tea leaf reading. And you know what that was? It was a cultural holdover from the old country of, of reading tea leaves that went far, far back, cultural practice. And so when they arrived in Canada, they gave themselves a pass, even though they were going to church, even though they uh, had the lordship of Jesus over their life, they gave themselves a pass in this area where they would continue to do magic. But <clears throat> your, yours might look a bit different. I'm just trusting the Spirit to speak to you this morning on this. And so where do you give yourself a cultural pass? Do you live with the Lordship of Jesus at home, but when you go to work and your boss asks you to lie about something, will you lie for them? What about when you're asked to fill out a financial form that didn't actually happen the way you're filling out the form, but you're asked to for a friend or a neighbor, whatever? What are the the different areas? Is there there any way, is there anywhere that it's basically a bubble where you give yourself a pass? Just examine your heart and your mind uh, and your life there. Second is what must be done in your family to establish or reestablish the lordship of Jesus. And so (coughs) there'd be more to talk about this if I didn't have the flu today. But when we think about uh, the lordship of Jesus in our families and in our homes, one of the things we need to wrestle with in Canada is that we view the lordship of Jesus as an individual basis, even within our families. And so we look at our sons and daughters, we, we look at parents and cousins where 
Well, it's a choice by choice of, of being a follower of Jesus. In this context and in some of the previous parts of Acts that we've been reading up to this point, what we see is that family leaders are the ones making the decision that say, our house will follow the lordship of Jesus. And they say, this is now who we are. And a fun way, like a, a fun way to, to view this is that you just take your last name and you say, <clears throat> we are the Brooks. And Jesus is Lord over our family. It's just who we are. And so as the leaders of your home, you establish the lordship of Jesus o- over your entire family. And there's still individual decision-making to be done there, but you create the family cultural norm that you are followers of Jesus, that he has lordship in your family clan. That's who you are. That's a core piece of your family identity. And so what that does is that that sets a foundation for the individual uh, uh, pieces of, of faith, for the individual decisions to believe in Jesus and to receive his forgiveness, that sets a strong foundation for your kids and grandkids to launch out from. Okay, and third and finally, what renewal can you thank God for that he has brought into your life? And so when you look back, um, either to your life before you became a follower of Jesus or your family history that goes back, is there a prayer of thanksgiving that you can make to the Lord today of, Thank you, Lord. I recognize there's a definite before and after because of the renewal that you have brought to our family. Our family, uh, and I experience uh, more of this Eden-likeness because of the cultural renewal that you have brought. Can you thank God for that today? And so I want to invite up the the worship team uh, again this morning, and I want to invite you to stand as we, um, I'd like to pray for us uh, as we come to a, a close for this part. <clears throat> and I want you to know I've, I've asked uh, Brother Pete in this service and Brother Ronnie to lead in communion uh, and in our community prayer time this morning, and, and I'm going to head out the back door and leave so I don't infect you with whatever it is I've got this morning, and I don't, I don't put it all over the communion elements today. And so let me pray for us, and then I'm, I'm going to head out. Let's pray. Well, Father, this morning, it is my, my prayer that uh, your word would just be alive and active in our hearts and minds. And Lord, we can look back and we, we can see that everything changes in life when we begin to follow you. And we we affirm, Lord, that we can't continue on in evil and we can't profit from what you say is evil and follow you at the same time. You don't make room for that. So, Lord, this morning, in whatever way that our disobedience has hindered you in bringing renewal, where where our decision-making is hindering the renewal that you want to bring into our life and into our families. Holy Spirit, would you speak to our minds and hearts this morning? May we hear your voice clearly, we pray. And Lord, for our families, in our marriages, in our parenting, please help us to first and foremost have a Jesus-centered at home, in our church community. And Lord, may that flood out into our workplace. May that flood out into our community with our neighbors. And Lord, may we be the salt and light that Jesus wants us to be. And so we pray this in his name. Amen.